Well, that didn't take long. Aston Villa already have their man, and he's coached David Villa, Sevilla, and Villa Real, so it's only serendipitous that he's finally ended up at Aston Villa. And we will talk about Unai Emery and a little bit about the process that's brought him here, which is still kind of an issue. Mwah. And later, we'll talk about Newcastle, Aaron Dank's last game in charge, but how interesting and exciting is this going to be? Cuddle up, pour yourself something nice. Let's celebrate the start of the Unai Emery era at Aston Villa. Now, before I get into the nuts and bolts of Unai Emery and Newcastle, producer Rob and I have come to what we think is a pretty big decision about this show, and that is that we are planning to leave this platform and move exclusively to a Patreon site by the new year. Many reasons for it, and the biggest being neither of us have the time to dedicate to doing this show properly in amongst everything else that we have to do. And we want to put more effort into it, better shows, entertaining, more informative, more tactical stuff, more bells and whistles, and more importantly, I have absolutely got to get to Villa Park before I die. I'm not getting any younger. I'm embarrassed I haven't been there yet, and I don't feel I can legitimately call this show authentic until I've been there, done a couple of live shows from there, gotten all that B-roll and material and documented that trip, it's going to be very, very good for my soul, but I can't do that with all the other stuff that I have to do. So I'm looking for your help. Producer Rob agrees. The other thing I'd really like to do, it's a bucket list item, is provide some streaming commentary from the games while I'm there and maybe put it on this channel. So what we're proposing is by January 1st, 2023, we move off of this platform and exclusively to Patreon. And what we're asking for is that you buy me and Rob a pint every month. And that's something you'd probably do already, the way that you've shared all these wonderful comments and support and messages and merchandise and all of it. Buy me and Rob a pint every month. That's five quid, basically. And if you commit to buying us a whole year of pints per month, we'll only ask for 10. So 50 quid a year to support the show. We will also have an extra tier for people who want to try to get us to Birmingham, have live meetup events and live online events, plus a lot of other bells and whistles. The site we're looking at is very impressive with merchandise and a whole bunch of other great stuff. Now, I realize you have already supported us and you'd say, yeah, sure, I'll buy you and Rob a pint every month. But the person sitting next to you may say, no chance. I've had this show for free this whole time. I don't want to pay for it. And by the way, times are tough. I'm stretched. I'm out. And I understand that. And we understand that. But for me to dive in head first into full-time Villa content and committing to that, although terrifying because I have a family and a mortgage, it's what I want to do. And I simply don't have the energy to keep doing it while also having a full-time job and a family. So I'm sincerely hoping that you will continue to support this show the way you already have. When Unai Emery was introduced as Arsenal's coach in the wake of Wenger stepping aside, it was an incredible process. Very comprehensive, very transparent, three-person committee criteria included. you got to play attractive football. You need to be able to improve players through coaching, and you have to integrate youth. They had eight candidates, all of whom stuck it out till the end, and in the end it was Unai Emery who got the job. And that was a whole lot more organized and comprehensive than how Villa went about finding Unai Emery. Now, in fairness, Arsene Wenger made it known he was stepping aside and the Gunners had that whole summer to find it. But for Villa, there was sort of a haphazard, maybe not panic is the right word, but a whiff of impulsion to this hire. Now, I don't know anything about Nassif Sawiris the guy, but there are conflicting reports as to the hierarchy's tolerance for Steven Gerrard, some even whispering and suggesting that they had lost their faith long ago and it actually identified Graham Potter as a possible solution, which then makes you wonder, okay, well, what made you nervous about Gerrard back then and why didn't you pull the trigger back then? But on that fateful night at Craven Cottage, 
there was a rash and emotional vibe to that firing because it occurred 90 minutes after the final whistle, which meant that Steven Gerrard was fired and had to ride home on the coach with the team, which is almost bordering on vindictive a little bit. And then, you know, the process to find the new manager also seemed rash, hasty, and not necessarily emotional, but we'll never know how long this process has actually been going on for. It might have been going on long before we even knew. One of the worst attributes an owner can have is impulsive or rash or ego-oriented, where you wake up in a bad mood one day and you throw out a plan that somebody else that you've hired has crafted strategically and through a lot of thought and philosophy. And, you know, this is one of the problems with Villa right now is that we don't have this strategic plan because we've gone from Dean Smith, who played one type of football, to Steven Gerrard, who went in a completely different direction, to a new guy who's totally different again. The one good thing I will say about Unai Emery, though, is that with this squad of players we have right now, I think he is probably the most capable of getting the most out of them without having to rely on a whole bunch more spending coming in to improve it. That's how good a coach I think he could be. I know you're probably sick about me banging on about this, but if you have your footballing system in place and you've got players with this criteria that play in this system, well, it becomes so much easier to find a new manager. You can narrow down your search because certain managers fit certain systems. This past year has proven Aston Villa has no plan whatsoever. I mean, it's been bordering on comical. They go from the father figure, man manager, culture building, mastery motivational type leader to a big name, inexperienced, ex-pro, ego, old school type to now an elegant and very successful foreign manager. And who was on their short list, which might have actually been drawn up as far back as Bournemouth, we'll never know. We heard Pochettino and Tuchel, so basically anybody who used to coach PSG was in Villa's crosshairs. But why those guys? What criteria led Villa to those particular managers? It just seems like the patience level and the managerial tenures are getting shorter and shorter. And are we going to get to a point sometime when we're going through so many managers, we're churning through them that there aren't enough qualified candidates to fill Premier League club vacancies. I'm looking at you, Wolves, and potentially you as well, Leeds. You know me by now. I'm obsessed with process. There has to be strategy behind decisions. No other business in the world would operate the way football operates. And maybe that's why we love it so much. There's a randomness to it. There's the human emotional element to it. But you know what? Every once in a while, even a blind squirrel can find a nut. And there can be no question that Aston Villa has procured one of the world's elite managers who has won things, who wanted to be here and who wanted to leave behind a club where he achieved things. And I think a lot of people also don't realize that his winning percentage at Arsenal is still better than his winning percentage at Villarreal. The first thing that strikes me about Unai Emery as a manager is that he was a very early adopter of video and data analysis, going all the way back to 2010. And just to give you an example of his meticulous nature, when they played Manchester United a couple of years ago in the Europa League final, he had his analysis team compile data from 17 Manchester United games, and he dug through all of it and devised a game plan, and this speaks to his obsessive nature. I'm okay with that. The problem is, though, he also used to give his players USB sticks with tactical and systems and patterns information, and my one worry is... Can the players absorb and retain all that information? Because that is an issue. It's one thing to know what you're talking about, to understand the technical aspect, but it's another to teach it. And I'm okay with meticulous. I'm okay with obsessive, which he is both. <laughs> but at some point, that information has to translate and be absorbed by the players. Still a youngish guy, too. Same age as Poch, younger than Klopp and Pep. And has managed 900 professional games. If he makes it to 1,000 with Aston Villa, 
This will have been a very, very good appointment. He's also shown a desire to return to the Premier League, applied for the Everton job, which Ancelotti got. And then there was the big deal last year at uh, Newcastle. I don't think Villarreal was very happy that he was trying to get another job. That's when this whole release clause business started. But look at how things have turned out in those appointments. Ancelotti was great for Everton, went on to Real Madrid, won the uh, Champions League. And now they're finally at Frank Lampard and it seems to be working out. And Eddie Howe is at Newcastle. That was the right decision. And Emery had more success at Villarreal. So I have this romantic notion about fate. You know, one path is blocked. You take another, then you have another diversion. And before you know it, you end up where you are supposed to be. Fate, no matter how it's happened, has brought Unai Emery to Aston Villa. And I hope you're impressed that I've gone this long without making a reference to the Count. Now, tactically speaking, he is a tinkerer, which is great news because it means he's not stubborn and locked onto some kind of system that he's trying to make work with a bunch of players that can't play it, like 4-3-3 with two narrow tens and the fullback. No. He is very versatile, and what's going to be interesting to watch is the in-game flexibility, because the best managers in the world change their systems as games are going on. And there are always slight variations between formations. For example, at Villarreal, he went 4-1-4-1 an awful lot, but he also played 4-4-2. In fact, very recently he did, in addition to 4-3-3 and 4-4-1-1. What counts is when you play those systems and how quickly the players can adapt from one to the next and know the role changes. And I've said this a million times about formations as well. It's all fantasy football until you lose possession of the ball. That's when formations matter. That's when you have to know your shape. You have to know your distances. You have to have the responsibilities and the relationships with your teammates so that you can be compact and make it difficult to be scored on. But I'd find it very surprising if he watched what happened against Brentford and hopefully what's going to happen at Newcastle and deviates greatly. I don't see that happening. Maybe, though, he finds a Villa player and says, you know, you are much more of this type profile player for me. Maybe we should try you here. That's the exciting thing, that hopefully he does rehabilitate some players and play them in their proper positions. Despite having many variations of formation and systems, the one constant throughout Unai Emery's career is that he loves and insists on playing from the back, and that will have implications in personnel, but he's very specific about how he likes to do that. I'm showing you in a static format here, and the positions and players are arbitrary, but you could see how in a 2-1-4-3 or a 3-4-3, Bubakar Kamara could really be used and excel in this type of formation as they're playing out of the back, which has the two fullbacks pushing high and wide. And this gives numerous passing options and outlets, even if the team is being pressed. So you simply cannot call this lad tactically clueless like we heard about both Dean Smith and Steven Gerrard. The only question is, can he relay these ideas and this information to the players? Because remember, They're now adapting for the third time in a year, roughly, to new ideas. So what do I like about Unai Emery? Outside of the obsession, passion, and meticulousness, all very good words for a manager. Well, he has done well with the clubs that are just outside those big ones in the leagues he's managed in, and he's had a big club in PSG. I mean, Villarreal and Sevilla are perfect examples of success stories. But he's also had to deal with a lot of disappointment and in some cases embarrassment. I mean, blowing the 4-0 lead for PSG against Barca when PSG was hell bent on winning the Champions League, that was a bitter pill to swallow. You learn from those kinds of situations and you learn from situations like at Arsenal. Tough gig, first after Arsene. And even though his winning percentage was better than a lot of people remember, He unraveled at the end because he didn't know how to manage the supporters. He didn't know how to manage the media. He wasn't helped out by recruitment. And then the whole Mesut Ozil situation did him no favors either. But don't you think that the best people learn from those experiences and grow? And how could you not love the silverware? I mean, this guy's won more Europa League titles than anybody. Look at how shiny that trophy is. I just want to be in that tournament winning one. I wouldn't even know what to do. It's so shiny, that thing, isn't it? 
And also, do you know what? His team wins in spurts and they rise to the big occasions. And that's been a problem for Aston Villa. Our club has not risen to the big expectations and the big occasions, with the exception maybe of the promotion final. Now, what might concern me about this appointment? Well, definitely the wide and widening gap between the Premier League and La Liga, which I think has something to do with economics, but the speed of play and the quality of opponent is totally different, so there's going to be adaptation there. But also, I know nothing about Unai Emery's man management style. And after Steven Gerrard, who was a very demanding manager who expected everybody basically to behave like him, I think Villa needs a softer touch and a different approach. And by all accounts, Emery is a very charming dude. And, you know, I also feel like foreign managers just have extra credibility given to them. And that's no disrespect to English managers. And I think Eddie Howe and Graham Potter are the exceptions to that rule. But this is a very foreign manager heavy league when you look around the Premier League. Uh, I found this too, and I thought it was really interesting. It's a little bit of uh, man managing, sort of like teams micromanagement training. And it looks like he's working on defending and covering defending, but these principles also work in the press. And I love how he just sort of broke out and took his players on and found time to instruct and, uh, and then just sort of carried on with the training session. Bottom line, I've been wrong about so much this year. I'm afraid to stick my neck out and make some kind of a prediction here. I was disappointed, obviously, with Smith. There was a risk with Gerrard that I was worried about. I don't feel the same way about Unai Emery. This is a capable man who potentially can help us with some of our wider philosophical issues and maybe help us find a director of football to work with him. But like I said earlier, if Unai Emery is celebrating his 1,000th game in charge of a professional football match while at Villa Park, then you and I have some exciting days to look forward to starting now. And I simply don't believe that the media will be as brutal on him this time than they were during his time at Arsenal. And Villa Nation as a whole seems to be pretty satisfied with the appointment. Just not Ali McCoist. So exciting prospect going to Newcastle this weekend and hopefully Villa turn out a better performance than the dross they served up in this fixture last year when they lost 1-0 on the Kieran Trippier goal. They were so poor that day. Newcastle coming off a big 2-1 win at Spurs. Before that, they beat Brentford at home by four goals. Oh, beating Brentford at home by four goals, you say. Hold my beer. Remember, though, It was just a year ago that the Saudi takeover occurred and Eddie Howe was appointed when Newcastle down near the bottom of the table. A year later, they're in fourth in the league. And the recruitment hasn't been lavish necessarily. Bruno Guimaraes, very good signing. So was Trippier, of course. But also the goalkeeper Pope, Dan Byrne, Chris Woods. I mean, not massively flashy names, but useful players who wanted to go there. And so there's hope for Aston Villa in the Newcastle model. But it's also the players that we wondered about last year, whether they were injured or whether they were performing, like Callum Wilson, who seems like a new player, but the most informed player perhaps in that team or in the league right now is the ex-MLS player, Miguel Almiron, the guy Jack Grealish made fun of. You know, I've watched Miguel Almiron for a very, very long time and a very fine player, Designated player too, but unlike some of the other MLS DPs, didn't just mail it in. This guy worked his socks off and the rest of the team followed, which is why those Atlanta teams were very good. If I could describe this guy, he's like the happy dog you take to the park that just wants to run, 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 run and chase and smile and run and run some more and never stop running. That's him. If the Paraguayan was a dog, he'd be a whippet. Perfect description. And imagine a team with him and a last St. Maximum in it. Oh my goodness, Eddie Howe's going to have to try to figure out a way of doing that because it would be very harsh on either one of them if he couldn't figure out a way. Then there's Kieran Trippier, who is doing it on the field and apparently off of it too, like a total culture changer in that dressing room. So good for them, happy for Newcastle in a way, but we can take some inspiration from what's happened at the Toon Because that was just a year ago when all those changes started. And although Unai Emery won't be in charge of that game against Newcastle, kind of ironic because, you know, he snubbed them very publicly when they were looking for a new manager last year. But he will be in charge on the horizon when we play Manchester United twice, which is also 
slightly ironic as that's the team he did in during the Europa League final a couple of years ago. Now, if you're Danks for the memories, oh, don't look at me like that. Everybody's using that line. But surely you are putting out the exact same 11 that you put out against Brentford. And last week, he had the built-in excuse of three games in a week to sit John McGinn and Jacob Ramsey. Well, he doesn't have that excuse this week. But what does he care? He's not in charge after this weekend. What does he have to lose? Does he have to worry about bad feelings between he and John McGinn or Jacob Ramsey? No. Put the same 11 that you put out against Brentford onto St. James's Park's pitch and let them express themselves again. I've not been this excited for a Saturday morning game in a long, long time. Newcastle playing swashbuckling, rampaging football, and that kind of suits, in a way, what we want to do playing in transition and on the counter. And if you can't get up for a game at St. James's Park as a footballer, you have no chance. You have no soul, frankly. Surely Villa in their primary kit, no? This is one of the uh, many kits that are coming my way. It's uh, on sale right now at the Fanatics Aston Villa team store. By the way, thanks to my fellow Canadian Richard Davies for your big impulse shop. He got the link from the description below, as can you. Save money, support the show. Until next time, enjoy Newcastle. We'll talk about it. And as always, up the mighty Villa. Villa.